Hi, I'm Vilas, and I am the Director of Engineering at Walmart Labs. Uh, I think I've seen a bunch of you folks before. Uh, what I'm going to share today is the story of what we went through at Walmart uh, scale uh, on when it comes to CI and CD. Um, the story really has a before and after, and I'll speak to you guys a little bit about what the before was and what we did uh, after. So first things first, Walmart scale. Um, there is, these are some pretty massive numbers. Uh, there is about 270 million people who walk into one of the stores or make a purchase on e-commerce weekly. Um, there is about 11,500 stores all over the world. Uh, and the net revenue in a year is about 500 billion. These are massive numbers, and to support a business of this size, uh, the backend uh, services and the applications that support it are also massive. So obviously, when there is thousands of applications in each technology and business pillar, they require an extremely robust platform to enable deploying constant innovation to the to wherever they want it um, in in a, in a quick manner, right? So that's the Walmart scale, let that sink in for a bit. Now the tech stack when it comes to Walmart is extremely varied. Whatever you can think of is probably something that someone has used. Uh, the tech stack at Walmart uh, has technology that ranges from the 1970s and the 1960s uh, all the way to the latest uh, whatever rust and go that people are into nowadays. So supporting that vast of a tech stack is not something that just comes to people, right? They're like, okay, generic, just plug this in and you can deploy your Informix and DB2 databases. That's not how it works. So the first question when the Concord team itself uh, started looking at uh, how do we orchestrate, right? So there was no Concord team prior. Uh, there was a continuous delivery team, uh, which was focusing on how do we get all of this software delivered to not just the e-commerce side, but also to stores. So anything on the uh, point of sale systems, that's something needs to be delivered as well in an efficient manner with low bandwidth tubes. So all of those constitute a very large population of questions that need to be answered and challenges that need to be overcome. So orchestration essentially was something that people were not even thinking of. They were thinking of automating the simplest possible thing, the lowest hanging fruit. So orchestration when it comes to the before Walmart was a no-go. We, we had no way that everyone could come together, share a single way of working and actually do DevOps in a single common way. So the, the team that I lead, uh, this is the motto of the team which is we want to make sure that every team that comes to us, we are able to empower them. We want to empower those teams to continuously deploy quality code. Uh, and so the, the key meanings are hidden in this, right? So you want to continuously deploy, which means you want continuous deployment. Uh, you want to deliver quality code, which means it needs to be well-tested, well-profiled, make sure that you're performant, resilient, all of the other stuff that is good and uh, good to have, essentially, right? All the warm fuzzies. Uh, and when you say empowering teams, you do not want to be the release manager. You do not want a release management team. You want a team that just flows innovation all the way from their brains into their code and into the cloud. So we are obviously cloud platform language agnostic from the start. So this is typically what people tend to think of CI/CD, right? You you build, uh, you you plan out this idea. This, there is some awesome idea in your head. You talk to your stakeholders. You say yes, implement. Customer is bought in. You start coding it in. You put that code wherever you host it: GitHub, CVS, SVN, whatever you like. And then you build it. You test it and then you deploy it into the cloud. But this is really not typical, is it? I mean, all of the people who have done some kind of continuous delivery know this is really not the case, right? Something else has to happen, which is we have to make sure that in today's day and age, uh, in the hybrid cloud environment, you have to have performant code, you have to have resilient applications. So performance, which means you want to make sure that you proactively and continuously ensure that any and all application code is performing to the best standards possible, which means you constantly squeeze it, you constantly test it, you profile it, and you make sure that the best possible uh, usage of capacity is what the application is using, right? Resiliency is now uh, something that's coming of, it, of, of, of its own, right? Previously at Netflix, it was a, uh, a pet project. Chaos engineering was something that was practiced in a smaller group. People were talking about it in hushed tones in the hallways, but it's not that today. It's really a burgeoning field that actually employs thousands of engineers all over the world. So resiliency really is about making sure that no matter what happens in the back end, your services to the users is constantly up to the mark. You're not you're, not give, you're giving them a degraded uh, service even in the worst of times, so some kind of a best effort. Um, so these are also important. So in reality, your CI-CD pipeline really looks like this, right? Which is 
you are, have a plan, you code it in, you, you build everything, you test it, and then you profile it. You actually run tests, right? You run a performance test, you run some resiliency tests, you deploy it, and then before you deploy, you actually run it through either a, some kind of a capacity management tool, or you run it through some kind of inference engine that tells you, uh, some kind of decision engine that tells you, okay, where should I really deploy it? And if you have multiple uh, data centers or you have multiple clouds where you deploy, it actually tells you here is how you deploy. You make sure that you are highly available, HA, uh, you are disaster recovery ready, so you're HADR. Uh, you make sure, so all of these things have now become de facto standards in the CI CD pipeline. If you have uh, a team that wants to get deployed to uh, cloud, these are the minimum requirements that they want. Uh, the, if you notice the yellow line that's dotted that comes through an inference layer is really the feedback that comes in that feeds the CI CD pipeline to get better. So anyone who's looked at uh, cloud, uh, so if you're deployed on a Google cloud or Azure cloud, you get, um, or, Azure, or AWS for that matter, you get utilization metrics. Those utilization metrics actually inform how your application is behaving in the open world. That informs how best to make it more performant, make it more resilient, and then you put those changes in, and this whole saga continues. This is how CI CD is uh, supposed to work according to what we do today. If you notice the clouds are multiple clouds, I mean, frankly speaking, some of them could not be cloud, it could be private data centers, but we still call them clouds because it's possible some people have open stack installations on top of them. So this is the uh, this is the the world of CI CD, right? So the reason why CI CD is hot and running really solidly today is because it is an actual viable business. These are companies with their valuations that have really made a mark. They have made CI CD a viable thing to spend money on to to sort of actually go in and innovate. So if this is real, then how do we make sure that we, as a company, ensure the best possible decisions uh, for our uh, a platform set. Do we build, do we buy? We go through all of the due diligence and we make sure that we do the right decisions, right? So we did do our due diligence and we found that some of the solutions uh, here met our needs, some of them did not. So we made sure that we can actually start from scratch and run it. So welcome to Concord. So introducing Concord to everyone. It's been open source for a while. We open sourced the code in November last year. Uh, but it's really something that we have been working on for more than 20 months, right? So uh, Concord exists specifically to orchestrate workflows. And the reason why it's that generic is because we wanted to make sure that it is not catering to a single use case of CI CD, right? CI CD obviously is an extremely complex process that teams are doing now, but it's also something that we want to empower other folks who are just doing complex tasks in the enterprise but not necessarily as part of CI CD. Uh, you could be, for example, updating canary uh, environments, creating new environments, deleting environments, doing stuff like that. Even all of that is considered workflow orchestration, and we cover all of that using Concord. So concord.walmartlabs.com is the site where all of this is uh, already present, and you, can, you guys can take a look at it. So what I'm going to do now is just go over to the concord.walmartlabs.com site and show you guys what's going on. So. This is the site. Um, if you look at the About Concord, uh, it'll actually tell you more about what Concord is. It's a workflow server. Um, one of the use cases that we present to everyone is CI CD. And that's why, uh, to going back to Jitin's uh, presentation earlier, I want to point out that CI CD is really a specialized use case of any kind of workflow or, um, orchestration, right? So, um, and also the question about Jenkins. Uh, there is no question of like competing with Jenkins. We, what we are doing internally at Walmart is, Instead of using Jenkins, we created our own open source build platform to scale uh, for our levels because Jenkins was unfortunately not able to scale to what we need. And then Concord essentially became a workflow orchestration layer on top. Uh, so all of the plugins that we created, so Concord does follow a plugin model, um, and that essentially allows us to be able to attach any kind of new CI CD rule into the plugin without having any kind of problem, any kind of sort of disruption to the main service. So, the benefits of Concord is that uh, because it was made and built for Walmart, uh, we are completely PCI compliant. Uh, there is also a lot of uh, audits that we have done with the SOX teams internally that are more restrictive than any other company on planet Earth. Walmart is a pretty large, uh, has a pretty large footprint all over Europe, which has way more regulatory compliance requests than here in the United States, and we are compliant according to all of those laws. So 
PCI certified, uh, SOX compliant, we are working towards all of the other certifications as well. And this is a huge benefit because a lot of teams do not understand what it takes to be able to get there when they build their own software. Or even when they buy software, there are times when SOX compliance in their own companies tend to be more restrictive or uh, and do not allow those uh, uh, solutions in. So simple benefits include a flexible architecture. It's a simple YAML-based um, it's a simple YAML-based workflow definition. So something that is called, um, I, I think um, there was like flows similar to, the, the, the workflow similar to how Screwdriver CD has their flows uh, defined, and that can essentially define exactly what you want to run, right? So all of our uh, cloud deployments, uh, both to private cloud, to public cloud in Azure, and to any kind of Kubernetes clusters anywhere uh, are all running through Concord right now. So. In terms of executions and endpoints, we we actually crossed that mark. Um, last month, we actually hit about 400,000 endpoints in a day, uh, and that beats any uh, open source or closed source software out there in the market right now. Um, at a single point uh, with concurrent uh, endpoints that we hit, that also exceeds 100,000 at various given points of the day. This is with a single Concord master. Um, it's completely dockerized, completely containerized. It can run or on itself, by, and Concord itself can deploy Concord, just like any good CI/CD tools should. Um, if you go to the Concord documentation, there is uh, a lot more about uh, get, get, getting started using Concord. How do you install Concord? It's a few easy steps. There are four simple um, set steps to do this. There is a backend server that maintains state. Concord itself actually creates the whole workflow process. Uh, there is a Concord console, which is the UI. It's a simple uh, UI, it's not complex. We don't, we're not really good UI uh, engineers, so we just slap something on top of it. We're good backend engineers, so we have a very smart Concord agent. Um, most of the decisions that Concord takes uh, are policy-based, which means uh, if we see there are certain kind of usages that are detrimental to the enterprise, we actually have policies that either limit those or control those in a sensible manner. So that's how Concord makes a huge difference. Uh, in terms of the backend, uh, how it works, um, this is a plugin model that is very similar to a lot of software that's being built right now. There is a central server which hosts all of the state management, the triggers, uh, any kind of policy management, all of that essentially is in the server itself. And all of the agents is where all of the plugins essentially come in, right? So we have plugins for multiple things. So there is an Ansible task plugin which allows you to do distributed uh, workflow. Uh, there is a Slack plugin, there is SMTP plugin to send out emails. Uh, there is Kubernetes plugins, Helm, um, KubeCuttle, there's Jira, there is GitHub. Uh, plus there is also stuff for um, performance testing and resiliency testing, right? So very recently we actually open sourced the plugin for Taurus. Taurus is the open source uh, tool for uh, running performance tests. So Taurus itself uh, allows you to run various kinds of tests. Right now we're supporting only JMeter. Going forward, we shall support Locust and Gatling as well. Um, there is also a Gremlin um, uh, plugin, which allows you to do any kind of chaos orchestration. So Gremlin is not an open source tool. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a software, it's a paid software, but uh, Gremlin is the only failure as a service solution that exists in the universe today. Question? Good question. So you can orchestrate chaos because the Gremlin master server and the agent is in a completely separate place than Concord is. Concord can kick off that and wait for the th event to end. Uh, it's an event. It's defined as a scenario with an event. Yeah. So Gremlin itself has a solution that basically provides a master where you have all of your scenarios created and all of the triggering mechanism. So the Concord agent communicates to the uh, Gremlin master and then just lets that flow. Correct. So, but, but we just do it in, in a way that Gremlin defines it as infrastructure failures, dependency failures, uh, and application failures. Question. I can really talk loud enough without it. <laughs> With the hangout. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So you said a master. Yes. And it fails. Yes. And now you're SOL for no, the so entire we have, system? Uh, we are highly available, yeah. So we are highly available, disaster recovery ready, so we have multiple uh, masters in different regions ready to go, yeah. That was the question. And we also have, so we have separation between the main uh, install of Concord itself and uh, for environments that are sensitive. So sensitive environments have their own Concord master that tend to have isolation and uh, are able to function independent of any kind of, so we don't have a single point of failure, essentially. Any other questions before I move ahead? 
So um, I will share out the GitHub location where you guys can learn more about this, um, obviously, and I'll get back to my presentation now. So uh, there's a lot more plugins coming. Obviously, I spoke about Gremlin and Taurus. Uh, the other powerful plugin that we have uh, open sourced recently is the Terraform plugin. Um, the reason is simple. Uh, we want to make sure that we give the teams ability to not just run a performance test, but also take the results of that and be able to control provisioning themselves. So if you control that provisioning, you can actually say, I can make squeeze tests on my own application to be able to see how much more efficient I can be and provide the same throughput with low latency, but with a smaller footprint. And for that, you will need multiple times that you need to uh, create and destroy servers in your cloud environment. That's what Terraform does for us. Right? Internally, there is a lot more plugins that we have created that we are trying to open source one at a time. Internally, we do use uh, pretty much ev any flow that you can think of. Uh, obviously, Jenkins, there is a plugin for Jenkins. Uh, but there's also plugins for a lot of other tasks that internally we use, but we can't really open source because there is still proprietary material on it. So we are working on that as we go along, and we, we open source it one at a time. So why open source? Uh, so this is a question that is that is that is a little more profound than what it seems at the surface. Um, when we started working on this, uh, the key concept was to make sure that we have a good solution for Walmart. Uh, we did not think about open source. We were thinking of making sure that we have something that's generic enough and that is very non-opinionated, which means we do not want to keep opinions on you have to use such and such. For instance, there are uh, cases where like Spinnaker has to have Jenkins integration. Uh, otherwise, there is problems, or you'll have to work really hard to move away from that. We, having been non-opinionated, helped us because of reason, right? Uh, the tech stack in Walmart is extremely uh, varied. It's extremely diverse. So we did not have the uh, option to be that opinionated. Apart from that, it works at scale. Once we found that out, we realized that the, you, the, the entire uh, uh, startup industry is essentially facing the problem of how do we actually use CI CD even when we are not ready to do enterprise level stuff? So something like that is was the motivation for us to be able to say we need to share our wins over with the with the general public. And the other thing was a plugin model. So just like we have been talking to teams uh, uh, in application areas, we have also been talking to CI CD teams that work on very different projects to be able to say how what about we build bridges from one CD tool to another. So one example of that is Tekton CD from, coming from Google. Uh, we've been discussing with them to say, okay, what if we build a bridge across from Concord to Tekton? Imagine if someone could be doing a flow on Tekton just because there is something that works for them. And what if they jump in right in the middle, do something that works on Concord and jump right back? Such kind of interdependency and interavailability is something that's crucial for any team to be able to use based on what's best offered by a certain product. And to, be, to enable something like that, a plugin model is crucial. So, at the, at, the, at the very last, uh, what we really wanted to do was provide workflow orchestration for all kinds of use cases. So Concord today deploys a software all the way from um, e-commerce websites to the mainframes and the POS systems and in the stores. So the gamut of applications that it covers is really broad. And to be able to open source something like that gives us the ability to listen to the community, see where the gaps are, and sort of help that innovation move forward. So CI CD, as I'm looking at today, is probably going to look very different 10 years from now. But in order to get there, uh, at least the key players in the game, the biggest players in the game, have to do their bit. And that's what Walmart thought as its responsibility to be able to open source and participate with the, with the entire um, um, industry. So obviously, it, it plays nicely into what we really want to do, which is empower the teams to be able to take these decisions, run continuous deployment, and actually have deliver quality code. So we are able to achieve that today uh, at Walmart. So this is the slide where I would say contribute. There is already a significant amount of interest. People are already uh, focused on this. And so contributing small pieces of code, we would definitely want you guys to take a look at it. If it is useful, reach out to us. We are always available to talk more about it. Um, the entire team is uh, sort of supportive of any kind of uh, issues that you can br bring up to us. We'll fix that in. And if you have feature requests, make sure you shoot us an email. We will definitely uh, listen to it, and we'll get that done. I don't have anything else. If you guys have any questions, I'm open to answering them. So with respect to continuous deployment, um, I, I spent uh, maybe half an hour looking at the code a few days ago mm -hmm. on GitHub, and it seems like it's a very nice tool 
from the point of view of the source repository. Mm -hmm. um, now, what tends to happen is if you, um, once you get to the built artifact, I think it, things get a little bit more fuzzy. Mm -hmm. And then when you get to the interaction of the built artifact with other built artifacts in production, it, um, it seems like that might be like the limit. In other words, how do you create that wonderful feedback loop mm -hmm. um, if, in fact, the purpose of the artifact is to provide services or interact? You know, if it's part of a, a delivery chain, yeah. right? Um, how do you figure out like what the interactions are, and is it is your piece causing the problem, or is it someone else's piece, and what version of that other piece that you don't know about? Sure. That seems to be the part where a lot of these tools, like Screwdriver and Concord, seem to um, uh, not address. Yeah, and there is, that's actually very intentional. Uh, the reason is simple, right? Uh, the reason is that uh, when we are doing the, such kind of inferences and feedback loops and things like that, they become extremely uh, specific to an application, a project, a business case, a business scenario. Those are not something that we want to solve generically. We want to advise, but we, as I said, that's the whole reason being non-opinionated on those kind of results, right? So there are tools in the market that allow you to do canary deployment. So Concord supports a blue-green deployment scenarios, right? Uh, you can actually just put that in your workflow and it'll deploy. However, it won't tell you what the policies should be to decide if your canary is healthy enough to go to fraud. That's a decision that you make based on a tool that you choose externally, uh, or you make decisions based on, for example, again, with performance tests, you can run a test, but what you do with that result, about how you profile your application, how you squeeze it, how you see what CPU and memory you need, that part is something that we let the application teams decide. And that's how CI CD should be. It should give you all of the basic building blocks to be able to run these tests, but at the same time should be able to pull back and say, okay, that's your decision to make, but here is a way you can do it, here is a plugin. And so if you feel that there is that gap, I would say uh, for your use case, if, it, if it's gr big enough that you think it's gonna help out uh, the bigger uh, community, I would say contribute a plugin, it's simple enough. It's, we have templates that you can just use and, and start writing uh, a plugin. It's all Java. Thank you. Um, so Vlas, it's interesting when you talk about <clears throat> Uh, I think in terms of what your solution provides for, and like uh, the extent, the extensibility and yeah. being non-opinionated, um, kind of a non-technical question here, but when you go into a business unit or you look to empower folks that, hey, we want to do CD, and they're yeah. sitting there, maybe they're in the data center and they're you know moving to AWS, whatever transformation they're going sure. through, and they, they want your help. Like, how do you guide them through that process? Because sometimes people don't know best practices and potentially when your solution has so much extensibility, sometimes... I don't know. So what, what does that process usually look, look like? I've seen mm -hmm. it both ways, but yeah. I'm just wondering how, how you, you see it usually. Okay. So yeah. yeah, so there is more detail, obviously, right? I'm, I'm obviously glossing over some of the stuff that uh, does happen in the background. Uh, the thing that happens in the background uh, with an engagement like such, right, is usually we, we plan out uh, where in the pipeline, or, or rather where in the process they are. If they're in the very early stages where they do not have a DevOps CD, CI CD pipeline or a DevOps process, that's where we start helping them. And we say, okay, let's let's actually attack the root cause, which is you guys don't have a process. Let's make sure that you have a good solid process before you start throwing stuff into production. If they don't have a PR review process, for instance, right, that's a problem. You want to fix that before people start committing random code into production, right? So you, we we address that in terms of so we have a team that's dedicated. So we have a DevOps dojo just like Verizon does and and other folks in the in the industry do, right? The DevOps dojo focuses on training and improving the education at the leadership level for DevOps. Once you have that, then we say, okay, make sure that you're building artifacts, you're versioning them. All of that good stuff, once you have that, then we say, okay, now you're ready for orchestration, and then we push them towards orchestration. And again, even when it comes to orchestration, typically it's the customer that comes to us and says, this fits my need, and here is how I wanna do it. So we usually come in and say, okay, that fits your need, here is how we can help you guys out. So the platform team is always ready to support no matter what the feature request is. So, so it's, it's very, uh, I mean, I would say the, apart from the plugin management, which is very federated, which means we essentially make sure that everything coming in is clean and uh, uh, adhering to our practices, nothing else is. It's democratized, democratized, so you can use whatever you want. Correct, correct, exactly. So we, we hope that, that one thing would influence the other. The best practices should influence where you go. And this has been designed based on those best practices. Yes. 
sort of driven by text files, basically. It's driven by YAML files, yes. Text sure, files. text files, fine. Therefore, in line with best practices, you, since it's driven by text files, you already have built into Concord automatic versioning and control of Correct. the text files. Correct. So, so all of the YAML, uh, all of the YAML files or the text files or whatever files those you choose to call them uh, are in GitHub or in some kind of source control already, and Concord just basically connects to it uh, to be able. So, Concord itself does not do versioning. The only responsibility that Concord essentially takes on itself is making sure that there is enough processes or agents to run what you need and it is the right kind of plugin management done to be able to do the tasks that you need. So. Yeah, no, the question was more on the order. You already have it configured to do versioning of its Concord itself file. does not do versioning of anything. It, it depends on the source control to be able to do versioning. Right. So yes. So the source control logic built into Concord. No, uh, source control is just a plugin that Concord uh, interacts with the right way. So you can actually do checks on uh, on source control. You can add like uh, logic on source control that we support, but we don't ourselves become source control, if that makes sense, right? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Vilas, one other question that sure. I had written down. One thing that you mentioned that I thought was extremely interesting was the idea of PCI compliance. Yes. And I think it would be a, a huge contribution to the community if, and I don't know if this, if you're already doing this, but if in the code you could indicate where a control point or where a particular threat attack surface might exist okay. um, so that people can be more mindful of that mm -hmm. if they do any changes or any enhancements. And I think there are relatively few um, uh, examples of working code that have that aspect uh, illustrated. So if you were looking to... Um, promote adoption, Got I think it. that's something that, that people would get excited, especially like the OWASP people, for example, yeah, yeah. would be very excited by that's that. That's actually a very good suggestion. I'll definitely take that back to the team. I I see a lot more, uh, I mean, just not just our project, but any project that tends to play in that space, it would be really nice to educate everyone else. So I, I definitely will take that back. That's good feedback. Thank you. Thank that's you so fantastic. much, guys. Thank you so much.